So we've taken a little bit of a field trip. We're not at PCA headquarters or the PCA garage. We're outside Atlanta, Georgia. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring to you a series of videos that continues our conversation that we had on how to buy a 986 or 996 properly. And more specifically, we're gonna talk about the three letters that typically causes people to, let's say, shudder when they're considering this model car, and it's the IMS. What is the IMS, the intermediate shaft? What is the IMS bearing, which is what people typically refer to in terms of things that might go wrong. So we're gonna go in depth. We're gonna introduce you to an expert in, the, in this area, and we're gonna take a look at the very specific parts of the engine, of the IMS, of the IMS bearing. So stay tuned. here at Flat 6 Innovations Research and Training Center. As I said, you need to know these three letters, IMS. If you've got a 1997 all the way to 2008, Eight. Um, 9 11. And the reason being is there's a lot of information out there on the web, but for me, going through all that and sort of scouring through what's good information versus just lots of, let's say, background noise, uh, we decided since we had the recent series of how to buy a 986, how to buy a 996 properly was hugely popular. So we're going to continue the conversation and we're going to go and really understand what is an IMS. What is the intermediate shaft bearing? So Jake from Flat 6, I appreciate you allowing us to come down to visit your facility. The reason being is I don't have all of this available to me at PCA headquarters um, and it's not sensible to ship all this stuff to us, so thank you for having us here. So let's just start from the very beginning. What is an IMS bearing? What's its function? And what are the different types that are in these engines? Well, the, the thing about the IMS is there's so many myths, like you said. And it, people think one thing, some, some things are logical, some things aren't. Then they read things in certain places, they watch YouTube videos in certain places, things start to conflict. So I'm, glad, I'm really glad you came down to do this video. Uh, I'm glad all you guys are tuning in to watch the video. Um, it makes a lot of the research and things that we've done collectively work out real well. Um, and you know, I wanna take everybody through these three different shafts we have here. We got the first, second, and third generation of the intermediate shaft, uh, the shafts themselves, and then we have the the first, second, and third generation of the intermediate shaft bearings as well. Great, so where does it all start? Did these bearings just simply appear in 97 or had these bearings been used in earlier engines? Well, actually, Porsche used an intermediate shaft, sometimes called a lay shaft, in the earlier engines from the 547 4 cam Carrera engine all the way through the entire series of the Metzger Flat 6 and the GT3 and turbo engines, also the water-cooled GT3 turbo engines, used an intermediate shaft as well. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, those were based on the air-cooled flat six, the air-cooled Metzger engine. Um, not until Porsche started allowing a ball bearing to support one end of the shaft did this topic start to come up. So in the Metzger engine, does it have a bearing that supports a shaft? It actually has two bearings but they are of a plain nature. So they are a journal type bearing that is internally lubricated via forced oil pressure feed inside the engine, like a, the main bearings that support the crankshaft or the rod bearings. So, so the myth, as you said, a lot of people refer to buying a Porsche with a Metzger engine erases this potential problem, but it's not that it has a problem because it still rides on a bearing, it's just on a different type of bearing. The, the problems that exist aren't because we have an intermediate shaft. The problems exist because of the way the, the bearing is supporting that shaft, the type of bearing that's being used okay. and employed in these water-cooled engines from 97 to 08. And that, again, that does not include the GT3 or the turbo engine. So okay. they, they retain those much later on. Okay, so first, let's understand where does this, can you show me on the engine? We have a couple engines here uh, that they've prepped for, for today. Can you show me where the IMS resides? Yep, absolutely. So we'll I'll go a little closer here and we'll show you on this training engine that I've got kind of as a cutaway view here. Um, we'll show you where the IMS is, kind of how it's driven, what drives it, 
and then we'll use our other two training jigs we have here for our hands-on classes to show you what that's actually driving. Okay, so the first thing that I want to do is familiarize you with the component layout of the M96 and M97 engine family. This began in 1997 and continued through 2008 with both M96 and M97 engine families. Uh, the components may have changed in their size and, and structure, but the component layout remained the same. So what we have here is crankshaft. Crankshaft, basically, when you're, when you're thinking about crankshaft, you need to think about your tachometer. If this is turning 3,000 revolutions per minute indicated on your tachometer, that's what you're reading, is crankshaft speed. Uh, crankshaft is the heart of the engine. All your connecting rods, which we have here for bank two, as we would be assembling the engine, they connect to the crankshaft. This is where we're taking a lot of energy uh, in, in starting to transmit it into the drivetrain. So the crankshaft is, of course, always the heart of the engine with every engine out there. Here we have what we refer to as the intermediate shaft tensioner paddle. Okay, this tensioner paddle uh, is coupled to a hydraulic tensioner that forces on this uh, little button here, and it forces this chain to tighten the drive chain for the intermediate shaft, which we have here. So basically, we are mechanically connecting the crankshaft via a chain down to the intermediate shaft. So in this location, the intermediate shaft sets below the crankshaft, and it will always be driven by the crankshaft, and then it will also drive some components as well. So here we are driving it, and then here, I'm gonna just lift up on this other timing chain, this chain will actually provide drive for bank one camshafts. Then on this end, this tank timing chain will provide the drive for your bank two camshafts. So here we are driving the intermediate shaft, and then it is also transmitting its mechanical energy out to these two timing chains, which are then going to provide rotation and valve timing for your camshafts. This is our intermediate shaft bearing that we're always talking about. So these are the different parts of the housing and kind of what they do. I've already explained that a little bit, but this main housing here uh, will provide the drive for the intermediate shaft and also the housing board to accept the intermediate shaft bearing. On this end, we have a plane bearing. Okay, so now we are on the opposite end of the engine. You'll notice we have the crankshaft pulley here. We were previously at the flywheel end of the engine or what would be closer to your transmission, just to familiarize you with the locations a little better. This end of the intermediate shaft has what is referred to as a plane bearing or a journal bearing that supports this entire end of the intermediate shaft. For reasons unknown, the factory decided not to incorporate this design on the opposite end of the engine where the inter intermediate shaft bearing is that's a ball bearing that we previously discussed. However, on all the air-cooled engines as well as the GT3 and Metzger turbos, they did retain a plane bearing to support both ends of the intermediate shaft. Now, it obviously is a different intermediate shaft because the engines are not close to each other at all in design. Uh, from a component standpoint. Also on this end, we have a drive that you can't see here, but it also drives the oil pump. So the oil pump would actually sit in this position on the front of the engine, and the IMS assembly would then drive the uh, eight millimeter size hex key and oil pump that sits here. So that oil pump is in a perfect location to provide pressurized, cool, clean oil to this journal bearing in this particular location. So the oil pump is here. It is being driven by the intermediate shaft assembly via the eight millimeter hex key. And then it is providing good solid oil supply for this very closely positioned plane bearing here. So one would assume that since it wasn't very easy to get oil to the back of the engine from the oil pump, that is why the factory utilized a different style of support for that end of the shaft. All right, well thanks Jake. Now that I have a better understanding of what the role of the intermediate shaft does, where the location of the bearing are, explain to me if you don't mind, 
what are the different bearings, what gear are they associated with in the various cars? Absolutely. So we have three different generations, and these particular generations have some deviation. There are some gray areas here as to when they could have started being used and when they stopped being used and when the next one came in and how long it was used. And, and there's directives out there uh, that people believe a lot of times based on either engine number or VIN number and they kind of take that as gospel when it really isn't because they don't know if their engine is original. Mm -hmm. A lot of these cars don't have the original engine anymore so they were changed under warranty or whatever. Um, or sometimes we find that those directives just aren't right. So, so the only clear-cut way is to actually inspect it. A visual inspection That's is required. Right. And, and I, I will share with you guys, so you can share with the audience, some close-ups of those things that they might see in their car. So okay. if they look at it visually with a bore scope or by pulling the transmission away or whatever, they can identify which bearing they have, not really which shaft, because there's some deviations there, but what, sh what bearing they have in that car based on the flange that's bolted in the back of the engine. Okay. So what do we have here? So this is the first generation. So basically this started out in 97 with a Boxster, uh, went through the, the early generation of the 996. It was used uh, up until the middle of 2000. Okay? okay, so if your car is a 99 or older, you certainly have this style unless the engine was a remanufactured or new crate engine installed by Porsche at a later date, okay. which they would always incorporate a newer style drive or shaft in a remanufactured or a new engine. So when they come up with latest and greatest, they apply that even to older cars. So everything's always done retrospectively. Okay. So 99, if you had the original engine, more 99% is probably this. Yes. But then when you get to 2000, it's sort of a transition period. That's right. And you might have this and you... Or you might you... have this. So okay. the difference between this shaft and, and the second generation is, is nothing more than the way that it's driven. Because here we have what we refer to as a duplex style drive chain. Almost like a dual road bicycle chain or what you'd see on a motorcycle a lot of times. Mm -hmm. um, those chains are a little louder than, than some other types of chains. Uh, they're also not quite as strong. So the factory did upgrade in 2000 and then we went to an internal tooth type chain. Uh, so this uses a much wider chain. Uh, it's a lot quieter. It has a lot more surface area to provide more accurate drive mm -hmm. and less wear as well. Uh, I've seen these chains break. I've never seen one of these break. I've seen these wear, but I've never mm -hmm. seen one of them break. So this was a good upgrade. Now 2000 is kind of a unique bearing, a unique shaft because it can have this style drive, but it can have either a single or a dual row IMS bearing, which we'll get into it a little bit later, okay? Uh, but this was used, this style drive was used from, from mid-2000 all the way to the end of the M97 production in 2008, okay? So this style drive didn't change. The shaft changed some though, but this drive didn't. So that's why these two obviously are very similar and these that's the step or the upgrade that they did that's right yeah this is this is much better technology and a much stronger chain than the earlier design mm -hmm. and then here we have the 06 to 08 style so this has a larger diameter bearing which we'll go over later you notice it still has the same drive um, there are other things that kill m96 or m97 engines like this one where a connecting rod broke a bolt and hacked through it so that's why you're seeing this it's just the only example that i had that had a bearing still in it here um, so basically the drive didn't change except for the fact of how large the diameter is here so when we get into things a little bit later you see we got a direct comparison with an early style bearing that's in my right hand and a later style that's in my left hand. So this bearing here would be reside in this? That's right. this bearing here. So the one on my right hand is what we refer to as M96 diameter. This is M97 diameter. Okay. So, uh, and again, with this, you can also have one of these shafts in a 2005 model year car. So we always call it the 06 to 08 because that's guaranteed. Every 06 to 08 that I've ever seen had it. Uh, every Cayman, every Cayman has this. I've never seen a Cayman that did not have this. Uh, but some earlier 997s, especially S's it mm -hmm. seems, have the earlier style bearing. They did not go to this bearing until later on after those engines were built. So sometimes an engine may have been built earlier than the car was produced. So okay. those, nobody knows how long those engines may have sat on a shelf somewhere after being prepared. 
So I think that's one reason why an 05 is that transitional year. So, you know, basically if you've got a, a 2000 model in your car, you can have either of these two shafts. <laughs> Um, if you've got an 05 model car, you can have either of these two shafts. If you have an 06 or 08, you definitely have this style shaft. Okay. Now one thing I want to point out is we have some of the bearings here to talk about later and their, their cross sections and cutouts so that you can see what's inside. But this one here has a seal and this is how the bearing would have been delivered from the factory. All factory bearings, the genuine bearings were sealed. It was a sealed bearing that was designed to be permanently lubricated. Okay, all right. Okay, so we've identified the three different generations of intermediate shaft. Now we're gonna go over the three different generations of intermediate shaft bearings. This is the dual row bearing. This was used from the beginning of the M96 engine in 1997 up through mid-year 2000. This is the single row bearing. It was used in mid-year 2000 up to mid-year 2005. This is the larger diameter M97 style single row bearing that is used 2005 mid-year up to 2008. So basically, this transition period happened in 2000 from the dual row to the single, and then we have another transition that occurred between the single row and the large single row in 2005. And we have a couple of cutaways, both the single row and the dual row here. And it's a dual row because it has two rows of, of balls. And, and therefore, it also has two races for in, inner and outer. And it has the cage that retains the bearing balls. Okay, so basically, this dual row bearing was used in 1997 through that mid 2000. Uh, model year point that we talked about earlier. Uh, when they changed shafts, they didn't really change the bearing because we've seen some of the earlier shafts uh, that always had the dual row bearing. We've also seen some of those mid-generation shafts that could have either bearing, okay? I also wanna to bring to your attention the wire lock groove. So the original dual row is a very wide bearing. And because of that, there wasn't really enough real estate inside the shaft housing, which we have here, uh, there wasn't really enough real estate inside of here to put a wire lock or a retaining ring that could be easily removed with a set of wire lock pliers, okay? So here, they actually machined a groove in the bearing, and when the bearing was installed, a wire lock would expand and it would lock into this a groove that was inside this housing bore. So that's how they actually retained this bearing that is special to the dual row bearings only. The single row did not have that and the model year 06 to 08 did not have that. So that's what this groove is here for. This is the single row bearing. So this one is the 6204 and we know that the most problematic of these three as proven by the Eisen versus Porsche class action lawsuit is the 01 or two, mid 2000 up to mid 2005 single row and this is referred to as a 6204 bearing sometimes so that's the actual bearing part number it is the lightest duty of all three bearing styles um, it only has one row of balls and it has one cage and it has one inner race and one outer race that's all that it has basically this is the most common of all bearings uh, it is also the most common to fail this is the model year 06 to 08, which also could have been applied in 2005, as we stated earlier. Now, it is also a single row. You don't have a cutaway of this one. This is also a single row bearing. You can tell that because it is roughly the same width as the prior single row bearing. The dual row bearing is, again, twice as wide as this, okay, because it has two rows of those balls and the races and, and the uh, cages. So the 06 to 08 bearing also has a larger diameter stud in the center. That's another way that you can tell this. And the 06 to 08 is of course what we have been able to determine to be the strongest of all bearings, seeing the least amount of failures in any type of service. All right, so that seems pretty straightforward as far as what intermediate shaft you should have in your car. 
But you know, it, it, aside from the transition years, which may be a little gray as to which one you have, what are the other common questions or scenarios where an owner might think he or she has a particular style bearing or shaft, but they really don't? So Vu, like we were talking about earlier about your own 996, because your car's a 99. So you haven't done anything to the IMS, you haven't done an upgrade, you haven't done anything. We were talking about this when we shot the first series of videos. Mm -hmm. And, and I said, look, you know, the dual row bearings, they are more robust, and, and, and you were glad you had a dual row bearing car. Well, the thing that, that the audience needs to understand is that a lot of engines did get replaced under warranty or, or, or after. People sometimes swap engines in and out with different, different year models of cars or whatever. But the biggest question we see, and the biggest question mark, is if somebody did have a replacement crate engine, be it remanufactured or a new engine, and there is a difference there, mm -hmm. okay, that was installed at an earlier date before they owned the car, okay? So let's say your 99996 is assumed to have this shaft with this dual row bearing, mm -hmm. okay? This carries a lot of weight because people think that it doesn't fail as often, okay? okay? Yeah. So you think that your car falls into that category, but let's say your car had the engine replaced in 2004 before you bought the car. Okay. Porsche always went back to whatever the current technology was at that time. So at that time, they were producing cars that had this shaft in it. This second is generation. what they would be making in 04. Exactly, this is what they were making in 04. So even though you had an earlier engine, it is still going to have the later technology applied to it. Okay. Not the latest being here, but what was current in 2004. Right. So now, you think that you've got a dual row bearing, which is believed to be more robust, and you're not worrying about it. But then let's say you probably really should be more worried about it because you have a more problematic shaft in the engine with the more problematic single row bearing, but you don't know it. Ah, okay. okay. Yep. So if anybody has a reman or a new engine, look at the invoice date. If it was basically between 01 and 05, then mm -hmm. you probably have this shaft. The same thing holds true if you have a later bought engine. Like, let's say you still have that 99996. Mm -hmm. Somebody bought a new engine in say 2007 or 2008, then you're gonna end up with the M97 style bearing because that's what the factory was using at that time. Now, there's a little gray area there because nobody knows how long the engine that you bought was in stock at the factory. You might have bought it in 06, but maybe it was built in 2005 or 2006. You know, six. So it could be it could be a little bit of a gray area. So now, it, if it was bought like in 2010 or 11, it's going to be this one. All right. that other stuff was out of stock. So those are the gray areas that we see, but that's why it's important that everybody do a visual inspection and understand what bearing you have in the car and then understand when the engine may have been replaced. Because without visually inspecting it, you're really just guessing. It's a complete <laughs> total guess. But all three of these have different flanges on the outside of the engine that will tell the tale. It'll tell you what you actually have, and that's what you need to look at. Because you, in engine building, we assume nothing and we quantify everything. And with this, you gotta do the same thing. I've had many people that did not do a retrofit because they thought they had a dual row bearing because they mm -hmm. thought they had this shaft. Then they end up having a bad day, mm -hmm. come to find out they really had this shaft with the single row bearing. If you do happen to have an original car with an original intermediate shaft with a single row or you have a replacement engine that has this one, that doesn't mean that you know, you're know you out of luck. So to speak. That's not the end of the world. Right. But you just need to understand this is what you have. factual information that even came from that class action lawsuit we were talking about that factual information says that this was the most problematic shaft of the three. Right. Thanks, Jake, for taking us through that. We now better understand the intermediate shaft. We better understand what the different bearings are on the cars. For our next segment, what should we focus on? Well, Vu, it's pretty much a fork in the road. It really is because you know, there's two groups of folks out there that I see that call my facility looking for guidance or want us to do a procedure or just go ahead and build an engine or whatever the case may be. And the, the two directions are one, you either live with it, like you've chosen to do with your car to this point anyway, mm -hmm. and you may choose to stay on that route or you may choose to go the other route down the other road and, and choose like one of the products I've developed and the tools and the procedures that we have come up with to replace the bearing 
with something that is a different design, maybe, or a bearing that is in a similar design, just with more superior components inside of it. So that's kind of the, the juncture that a lot of people are at, and that's why the video is important, I think, as well, is because we can properly educate folks now about these differences and let them make their own decision based on how long they want to keep the car, how much they drive the car, what the overall goal for the car is, and, and really what their budget is. Okay, so now we know what IMS, IMS bearing is. On to the next video.